Hey, welcome back to All Your Tech. As always, I'm Brian Lovett, and today I'm going to show you my NAS. It sounded way different in my head before I said it out loud. If you're new to the channel, I like to build cool stuff and talk about it. Today we're going to talk about my network attached storage server. Now, what is a NAS in the first place? Well, as the name implies, it allows you to access storage from across your network. All of your connected devices have a centralized place where you have a massive amount of storage. In this case, we've got about 40 terabytes here in this case. And actually, we're going to update this to 60 terabytes today. I'm going to show you how easy that is to actually get in and do. So what are some cool things you can do with a setup like this? Well, you can either buy an off-the-shelf NAS, something like a Synology, but they're typically fairly expensive and they have a limited amount of processing power inside. So really, it's just file storage. In this case, though, we're able to add a GPU and some other things to this and make it good for things like home automation or even post-processing of video. On the software side, we're going to run Unraid for a number of reasons, one of which is that a lot of these hard drives that I was using are mixed sizes. Some are 8 terabytes, some are 10. And by having mixed size drives, you can't put those into a traditional RAID array without losing out on the storage. With an Unraid setup, you can use mixed drives. With that out of the way, let's jump right in and take a look at the hardware choices I made. Of course, there's going to be a list of all of this down in the description below in case you want to pick some of this up on your own. Now, if you followed any of my builds in the past, you know that I typically use AMD CPUs. I'm a big fan of AMD in general, so why does this have an Intel chip inside of it? Well, I went with an Intel 11th generation 6-core processor because they have an integrated GPU that has something called QuickSync. Now, if you're building a Plex media server and you plan to transcode or convert media files in real time across the wire, you're gonna want an Intel CPU because QuickSync allows you to transcode multiple streams of videos in near real time. And in this case, I'm gonna have a number of not only 1080p videos, but also 4K videos that need to be streamed to multiple different client types. This is gonna handle it without any. Now, earlier versions of Unraid did have problems with 11th and 12th generation iGPUs in Intel processors. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. I've been able to pass through mine without any issues whatsoever. Outside of that, you might notice that I also have a GTX 1070 NVIDIA video card in here. When I set up my home security system through Home Assistant, I wanna be able to actually do some artificial intelligence processing of the images right here in-house. That's gonna take care of that. I can also convert a lot of my 4K video files into smaller file sizes using transcoding, converting them to H.265. Now outside of that, this has regular spinning disks in it for the main storage. It has 32 gigabytes of RAM because you want a large buffer for cache, especially if you're running virtual machines and Docker instances for other software services. And then finally, this motherboard has three M2 slots. I've got two NVMe drives in here. One is a 250 gigabyte drive that I have all the applications stored on for fast read and write access. And then one is a two terabyte NVMe that I use for fast access to cache. Whenever I'm writing files, I'll write them to the NVMe drives, and then those get sent over to the array at a later date and time. So what's the downside to a setup like this? Well, it turns out that you have a parity drive. The parity drive essentially stores all the information to rebuild the entire disk array should one of the drives fail. Now this also means that you're right limited to whatever the slowest speed of the slowest disk in the array is. So that's why we use the NVMe drive as a caching layer because we know that we're going to be I.O. limited by the drives that we chose. Now probably the final piece of hardware I should mention in here is this SATA expansion card. This motherboard has six SATA slots on it. That's enough for most people, but I needed an additional four just for some expansion as I add more drives to this. So let's rip this thing open, add the two drives, and then I'll take you on a tour of the software. Now, obviously, the first thing we got to do here is open up the case. So we're going to go ahead and take some of the screws out here, pull this guy open. And you see this case has tons of space, both underneath and up there on the main section. Now, space is getting a little bit tight in here, but we'll go ahead and plug in our two additional SATA cables, and we'll sort of tuck the cables away a little bit. Keep them out of the way as much as possible. I feel like SATA power connectors and cables in general never go in the intuitive direction that you expect them to, uh, but that's just me maybe. 
but it seems like all these years of building computers, I still start to put it in the wrong direction almost every single time. All right, let's get those hard drives mounted in there, get it cleaned up just a little bit. Go ahead and button up the side here. Everything looks pretty good. Now we've got this, the cables run over here. It's actually not too terribly bad. It's, uh, it could be much worse. Still pretty clean inside. Don't judge me too hard. And uh, now that's buttoned back up, let's go ahead and jump into Unraid and see how we get these added. All right, this is my first login right after adding the drives. Let's see if it actually worked. Fingers crossed. Awesome. Okay, so you can see down here towards the bottom, there are two unassigned devices, two 10 terabyte hard drives. There's also a 512 gigabyte Samsung SSD, but we're not going to worry about that right now. So here's what you need to do to go ahead and add a new disk to your array. You can see that up here we've got our parity drive and then we've got five other disks for a total of 42 terabytes of usable space. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna go down to the very bottom and you wanna stop the array. That'll take just a moment to complete. It takes a few minutes, but once the array has stopped, you'll notice that up here there are two extra disk slots and they both come up as unassigned. Now you can change the number of slots here so you can add more or fewer, but in this case, this is the correct amount. So what you can do is grab SDH and we can grab SDJ. Now this does know that all existing data on the device will be overwritten as soon as the array is started. So keep that in mind. Don't put a disk in here that has any data in it, but you probably already could have figured that out. Now the next thing to do after that, simply start the array. Now, before you set up this entire system, before you added these extra disks to the array, it helps if you format them, if you wipe them completely clean, you don't really want any partitions on there. Let's go ahead and click Start. Now, as soon as the array starts, you're going to see a whole bunch of write activity to those two drives, as well as the parity drive up at the top. And what it's doing right now is it's formatting the drive and it's also getting it added to the array so that all of the data can be transferred in between these disks without issue. Now, how long is this going to take? Well, pretty long. You can see down here that at 250 megabytes a second, it's going to take about 11 hours for this process to finish. Now in the interim, the array can still be used. You can still read and write from the rest of the disks in the array. It may slow down the process slightly, but you know, at least you can still do things while this is going on. And what are some of those other things that you can do with an Unraid setup? It's actually really cool. This dashboard kind of shows you a little bit of it. You've got over here on the left-hand side, you've got all of your processor core information so you can see in real time how your processor is performing, memory usage, and network interface statistics. In the center, you can see the shares. These are basically just the drives that you've shared with your different applications. You can see virtual machines and Docker containers. We'll jump into that a little bit more right now. So as you go over here to Docker, you can see that you can run a number of different Docker containers and you just set these up via the apps section of the system. So whatever you wanted to run in here, let's say Plex media server, you can just do a search for Plex, pull up one of the media servers and go ahead and select it and install the Docker container. It's as easy as that. Seriously, it's up and running and it's not a big deal. You can configure it while it's running and get everything set up the way you want to. Now, in my case, as I said, I want to do a media center for this. So I've got radar and sonar. Those are for ripping movies and television shows. NZB get is the actual method you use. It's the software you use to actually download the movies and the TV shows. And then Plex, of course, is how you stream it to all of your services. So you can see that it's all in one place. When there's an update, you simply apply update over here and it's gonna do a Docker install of the latest version. It's really simple, really easy. You can take snapshots so that you don't have to worry about doing something wrong on the configuration and losing everything you spent all that time setting up in Plex. It's a really nice setup. 
Now, apart from that, you can also run VMs or virtual machines. In theory, what you could do is you could set up a centralized system that has, say, two or three GPUs in it, a whole host of RAM and a whole bunch of CPU power, and then you could split that up among multiple different desktop computers in your house in case you had multiple kids that wanted to play LAN games or something like that. And then you don't have to have a desktop in each room of the house. You just tap into one of those virtual machines and you have an entire functioning system that you can spin up and spin down at your own will. You can set how much memory and which CPU cores each of those VMs has access to so that you can really segment things out kind of however you want. It's a pretty cool setup. For the home automation side, I can run Home Assistant Operating System and that gives me the ability to do some really cool stuff with my house. As you can see, I've got this dashboard set up that has every single room in my house and all of the smart devices within it. I can pull up the living room, adjust my Nest thermostat, see the actual temperatures, and even turn on and off all the lights. I can go into my backyard and see real-time streaming from my Nest cam, turn on and off my patio lights, even change the color of my Hue spotlights in the back. And there you have it. Of course, we're just scratching the surface of this entire setup. You can do a lot more cool stuff with this. So let me know down in the comments below what you want to talk about next. If you have any questions that I can help answer about the hardware or software. Otherwise, hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.